Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house for this holiday worship. Happy 4th of July. Hope you enjoy the fireworks tonight somewhere. Remember that the office is closed tomorrow. It's a holiday. So Holly will be in on Tuesday or Wednesday to do her normal uh, clerical functions. A reminder to members of the Administrative Council, the Council meets Thursday evening of this week at 7 o'clock, and it's always an open meeting. If anyone would like to come and see what goes on in our business sessions, you're certainly welcome. We continue to remember the family of Earl Deegan, who died on June 16th. Continue to lift them up in your thoughts and prayers. Are there any other announcements or joys or concerns to share? Remember that there's coffee fellowship afterwards. Well, that's a joy. We're glad for that. So don't hurry off. All right, Lisa will lead us in our first hymn. Good morning. Please stand for our opening song for worship, America. as we join together in the Litany for Independence Day that is on the screen before you. As we remember the birth of our nation and the gifts of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, let us offer our thanks and prayers to God, the giver of all good gifts, for the men and women who braved the long journey by sea to come to this new world, for patriots who dreamed of and fought for a free nation, for the men and women who laid the foundation of our democracy and who pledged liberty and justice for all. For those who built this country brick by brick, road by road, and town by town. 
brave soldiers who have fought for our country, for all who paid for our freedom by their service, and those who paid by their sacrifice. For the innovators and artists, poets and teachers, farmers and factory workers, for all who labor and provide for the common good. For this land, with its peaks and valleys, coasts and deserts, fields and meadows. For our own community, for those who came before us in this place, and for our neighbors, near and far. Lord, we pray for the United States, that we might always be a nation which defends and promotes liberty and freedom, truth and justice. That we might always be a nation where all are free to worship and pray. That we might be a beacon of freedom to all those whose lives under the shadow of terror and hopelessness. That those who are elected to govern and lead would be guided by you and be ever aware of the trust that has been given them. That we would be a people who repent from our sins and who always turn to you and to your grace. Gracious God, Father of all nations, bless and defend us and our land. Prosper the work of our hands and increase in us your grace and compassion and our offerings of thanks to you, our rock and our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Let us join together in the congregational prayer that is before you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your love has made us, your love keeps us, and your love would make us perfect. But we have not loved you with our whole nor have we loved others as you have loved us. We have not lived by faith. We have resisted your spirit. We have neglected your inspiration. Forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are. And through your spirit, direct what we shall be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand for Maker in whom we live.
may be seated. The scripture for this Lord's Day is from Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, the first six verses. And Mark records. From there he went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and a large congregation heard him, who heard him, asked in amazement, where does he get it from? What is this wisdom he has been given? How does he perform such miracles? Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? So they turned against him. Jesus said to them, A prophet never lacks honor except in his hometown, among his relations and his own family. And he was unable to do any miracle there except that he put his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was astonished at their lack of faith. The word of God for the people of God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Stephen was a young man who felt the call of God on his life. He came from a really close family. He finished college and then went off to seminary. After finishing seminary, he came back home before going to his first church assignment. He visited with all his relatives for about a week, and he stopped at his home church, talked to his pastor. And the pastor asked him if he would like to preach that upcoming Sunday. And well, Stephen felt honored and took the pastor up on this invitation. Sunday morning came, and after hours, yes, even days of preparation, Stephen stepped behind the pulpit, looked out at the congregation of friends and relatives, and started to expound the knowledge that he had learned in all, from all those years in seminary. He had hardly begun when his young niece, Kathleen, six years old, stepped out into the aisle, put her hands on her hips, put her left foot out in front of the other, cocked her head to one side and said in a very loud and clear voice, Uncle Stephen, you don't know... Well, I don't know about Uncle Stephen, how he finished that message. It would have taken the wind out of my sails. But undoubtedly, it was an experience that he will never forget. You know, it's hard to impress the people at home. The whole world may be singing your praises, but at home, folks see you as the shy kid with two left feet or as the wild guy who was always in trouble. The Gospels tell us that Jesus was enjoying unparalleled success all around Galilee. Crowds were coming to hear him. They wanted to hear what he had to say. They wanted to hear him teach. They wanted to experience his healing power, to witness a miracle. By his disciples. And when the Sabbath day came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Now understand that in Jewish life of that century, and even to, to today, it is the right of any adult male to speak in the synagogue. And so, Jesus began to, to read from the scrolls and to teach. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. And what's this wisdom he's been given? He even does miracles. But isn't he the carpenter's son? Isn't he the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And Mark tells us that they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, Only 
his own town among his relatives and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could do no miracles there, Mark says, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Thomas Wolfe, who said you can't go home again, grew up in a large house at 48 Spruce Street in Asheville, North Carolina. He wrote about his growing up years there in a novel which he called Look Homeward Angel. So frank and realistic were his reminiscences of that, that time that Look Homeward Angel was banned from Asheville's public library for seven years. But today he's a favorite son, but for many years he was an embarrassment to the residents of Asheville, North Carolina. You see, Jesus was an embarrassment not only to his hometown, but also to his own family. Because earlier in Mark's Gospel, we read these mystifying words. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. Think your family doesn't appreciate you? Well, welcome to the club. Jesus wasn't appreciated by his family either. His own family thought he was out of his mind. Resonate, resonate with a few of you. Maybe you don't feel appreciated either. Maybe you don't feel appreciated at home. People there don't treat you with much respect. Maybe it's at school and you feel you don't get any respect. Or maybe it's at work. Maybe it's even here at church. Someone else gets all the recognition. And that happens to us. The late comedian Rodney Dangerfield made a career out of not getting any respect from his wife, from his kids, from his parents. He once said, I don't get any respect from my father. He carries around the picture of the kid who came with a wallet. You know, it happens in families, communities, in the workplace, in churches. No respect. A pastor named James Hewitt tells about his son who was using super glue on a model airplane that he was building. <laughs> the dad says, in less than three minutes, his right index finger was bonded to the shiny blue wing of his DC-10 model. He tried to free it, he tugged, he pulled, he waved frantically, but he couldn't get his finger free. Soon they located a solvent that did the job and ended the moment of crisis. Then this pastor writes, Last night, I remembered that scene when I visited a new family in our neighborhood. The father of the family introduced his children. This is Pete. He's the clumsy one of the lot. And that's Kathy coming in with mud on her shoes. She's the sloppy one. And as always, Mike is last. He'll be late for his own funeral. So James Hewitt goes on to say, that dad did a thorough job of gluing his children to their faults and mistakes. People do it to us all the time. They remind us of our failures, our errors, our sins, and they won't let us live them down. Like my son frantically trying to free his finger from the plane wing, there are people who try sometimes desperately to free themselves from their past. A couple of years ago when I was on vacation in Texas, it was a habit to go to church on Sunday morning, seek out a United Methodist Church, and we did. We found one just a few miles from where we were staying. And here it said the name of the United Methodist Church, and underneath the name of that church, it said Church of the Second Chance. Church of the Second Chance. I liked that. This church was filled with people of all ages, older folks, middle-aged folks, younger folks, kids everywhere, because people were looking for a second chance. Everyone would love a chance to begin again. 
When we don't let people forget their past, when we don't forgive, we glue them to their mistakes and refuse to see them as more than something they have done. However, when we forgive, we gently pry the doer of the hurtful deed from the deed itself and we say that the past is just that, the past it's over and done with. Well, obviously, Jesus didn't have anything that needed forgiving. The scripture says he lived without sin. But people in his community would not let him forget that he was only a carpenter's son. In their minds, he was still one of the neighborhood kids, someone to be taken seriously. We understand that. What is it they say? An expert is someone who's 50 miles away from home. The interesting thing is that Jesus could not do any miracles there. Mark goes on to say, except lay his hands on a few sick and heal them. He could not do any miracles. Does that mean that when we do not take people seriously, when we do not give them the respect they deserve, we may cripple their effectiveness? I think so. There's a story that I came across. The story is of a man named Johnny Lingo. It was even made into a motion picture, according to the article. Well, Johnny Lingo lived in the South Pacific. The islanders all spoke highly of Johnny. He was strong, good-looking, and very intelligent. But when it came time to find a wife, people shook their heads in disbelief. The woman Johnny chose was plain, skinny, walked with her shoulders hunched over and her head down. She was very hesitant and shy. She was also a bit older than the other married women in the village, which did nothing for her value. But Johnny loved her. What surprised everyone most was Johnny's offer, because in this culture, in order to obtain a wife, you paid for her by giving her father cows, the bride price. Four to six cows was considered a high price. Other villagers thought he might pay two, even three cows for his new bride. Two or three cows at the most. But he gave eight cows for her. Eight cows. Everyone laughed about it since they believed his father-in-law put one over on him. Some thought it was a mistake. Several months after the wedding, a visitor from the United States came to the islands to trade and heard the story of Johnny Lingo and his eight cow wife. Upon meeting Johnny and his wife, the visitor was totally taken aback since this wasn't a shy, plain, hesitant woman at all, but, but one who was beautiful, poised, and confident. The visitor asked about this transformation and Johnny's response was, I wanted an eight cow woman and when I paid that for her and treated her in that fashion, she began to believe that she was an eight cow woman. She discovered she was worth more than any other woman in the village. And what matters most is what a woman thinks of herself. If you don't get much respect, remember Jesus. His own family and his own town could not see who he was. But that did not keep him from achieving his purpose in life. Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith, Mark says. But it didn't slow him down. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew why he was here. He served God, and he gave himself completely to the task at hand. Henry Ford, the American industrialist and automobile pioneer, once said something quite encouraging to those who might not feel appreciated. Now, he was speaking of his car, the Model T, all of which in the early years came in the same color. His words still ring true. This is what he said. All Fords are exactly alike, but no two people are just alike. Every new life is a new thing under the sun. There has never been anything just like it before and never will again. 
A young person ought to get the idea, get, ought to get that idea about himself. He should look for that single spark of individuality that makes him different from everyone else and develop that for all he's worth. Society and schools may try to iron it out of him. Their tendency is to put us all in the same mold. But I say, don't let that spark be lost. It's your only real claim to importance. That from him. That's a good word for all of us. We may not be getting the positive strokes that we deserve, but that need not keep us from being all we can be. Because there was a man hanging on a cross who was rejected by his own family, his own town, his own nation. But he saved the world. And he says to us, keep the faith. You are a unique creation of the living God. Let no one tell you that you are of little worth. You are of ultimate value to my Father God. You are so valuable that I died to save you. Here is where true self-respect begins. It's when we realize that we are a child of God. It begins when we realize that Jesus Christ died on our behalf. It begins when we hear Jesus, who didn't receive any respect from his own people, say to us, your sense of identity comes from me. I respect you. I appreciate you. I died for you. I believe in you. And I have a purpose for you. Believe in me and never question your self-worth again. So here is where it all begins. Our lives can be turned around by trusting ourselves to Jesus. May it be so for all of us. Join me in prayer. We thank you, God, from the lesson from we thank you, God, for the lesson from Scripture this day. We see how Jesus was treated by those who knew him best, and yet it did not dissuade him. And for us as well, Lord. We are who we are because you have called us to be who we are. And so in that knowledge. Let us live out our lives seeking to serve you and others. When we don't feel like we're respected, we need to understand that you respect us because you loved us enough to die for us. So we pray, minister to us that our faith continue to grow strong. Minister to us that we might find ways to serve you. Minister to us that we might reach out with your love to those around us, family, friends, neighbors, strangers. On this 4th of July, we give you great thanks for the nation in which we live. Troubled as it is right now, we still have the, we still have the best country to live in. Not that other people's countries aren't great too, but look, look at our country. Look at what you've enabled us to do with your blessing. And so we give you thanks for the United States of America and for our place in this great land. Continue to bless those who seek to lead us in government. Speak to their hearts and minds. They might end the partisanship, the wrangling, the animosity, the them versus us mentality. Lord, keep our country great and free and strong. We pray for our military men and women, those who are coming home from Afghanistan, those who continue to serve in hot spots around the world, those who in any way are in harm's way. Guide and lead us on this day as we gather with family and friends, as we celebrate the 4th of July, as we travel, as we what a fireworks displays. Let us know that all of our life is in you. 
And we pray, God, that you will minister to us to that end. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I invite you to stand as our gifts and offerings are brought forward. Amazing Grace, verses 1 and 2. on this the communion ritual is on the screen before you it's also found on pages 13 and 14 in the hymnal if you would rather look on there the Lord be with you, and also with you. lift up your hearts let us give thanks to the Lord our God it is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering and death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave you thanks, and broke it. And gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And you have your communion cup, and carefully peel back the cellophane to reveal the wafer. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. And then very carefully peel back the next layer to reveal the juice cup. This is the blood of Christ. Take and drink. And so through the broken bread and the shared cup, we proclaim the Lord Jesus, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and his hope for coming again. Amen. Verses 4, 5, and 6 of Amazing Grace. If you would stand.
It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Go in peace.